What is Leviathan? The most substantial description we find of this creature comes to us in Job 41. If you go read that passage, you'll notice how frequently and emphatically it is stated that this dragon is a fire breather. Young Earth creationists like those that answers in Genesis actually bite the bullet on this one. Since they can't theologically tolerate the conclusion that the Bible is simply describing a mythological dragon, they are forced to the conclusion that there must have lived alongside man some species of marine reptile that possessed the biological capability of literally breathing fire. Boys and girls, the Bible is talking about a creature that breathed fire. Now, people say to me, Mr. Ham, you don't really believe that. How can you trust the Bible, an animal that breathes fire? Hey, you know what? There's a little beetle in today's world called the bombardier beetle. And the bombardier beetle actually has twin cannons in its rear end, so when a frog comes up to eat it, it'll mix chemicals together and blast out fiery gases at 212 degrees Fahrenheit. I think the little beetle could do that. I think you could have a fire-breathing dragon, don't you? Absolutely. It's a real creature. But could it really breathe flame? Well, it's not a problem, as far as I can tell. It's not a problem that God could make an animal that can breathe fire. I mean, think of the other amazing creatures that God's created, like the bombardier beetle. In fact, most animals produce methane anyway, which is a flammable gas. If you just had a way to ignite it, you could do it. It's not a problem. I want to show you why we know beyond doubt that Leviathan is not a member of the animal kingdom. The first clue to unveiling the dragon's identity comes to us from a biblical text frequently overlooked. Psalm 74:14 reads, It turns out grammatically that this passage is describing a creature with multiple heads, a hydra. In the Hebrew construct, heads of Leviathan, the term head appears in the plural state marked by what is called a sere yod, in conjunction with the singular noun Leviathan. Why is it significant that we have a biblical text that speaks of Leviathan as multi-headed? Because the Israelites weren't the only Near Eastern people group that described the dragon in this way. Not many people know this, but Leviathan was also spoken of on ancient stone tablets written by another civilization to the north of Israel and Syria. Ugar was an ancient Baal worshipping port city that archaeologists began excavating in the late 1920s. It's difficult to overemphasize the importance of this find to biblical studies because Ugarit's language is the closest ancient tongue to Old Testament Hebrew that's been discovered. Let's compare some of the lines from one of the Ugaritic Baal tablets with an allusion to Leviathan found in Isaiah. The Ugaritic passage here is older by many centuries. When you smote Latanu, the fleeing serpent, annihilated the twisting serpent, the dominant one who has seven heads. Isaiah 27, 1. And that day Yahweh will punish with his greatly fierce and mighty sword Leviathan, the fleeing serpent, Leviathan the twisting serpent, and he will slay the dragon that is in the sea. So the first important similarity between these two texts is that the consonants for the Ugaritic dragon named Litanu or Eltian in Ugaritic are contained within the consonants comprising the word Leviathan in Hebrew. You will notice also that like Psalm 74, the Ugaritic dragon is a hydra. In fact, it has seven heads. However, the real nail in the coffin that proves their mutual identification are their cognate titles, Fleeing Serpent and Twisting Serpent. As the Ugaritologist Ola Vikander at Lund University writes, these terms are so rare that, quote, it is quite unthinkable that the combination of these two specific words could have arisen by chance, both in Ugaritic and in Hebrew literature. And so, a historical connection must be postulated. The connection between Leviathan and Latanu, therefore, quote, is rather well known in modern exegetical scholarship. On top of all this, these texts, the Ugaritic ones, Psalm 74 and Isaiah 27, all depict the deity smiting the dragon. In Psalm 74, 12-14, God even smites Leviathan as part of the act of creation. In the Isaiah text, it's said that God will smite him a second time at the end of days. If the biblical authors are talking about a literal animal, why doesn't the creation account in Genesis also have God slaying a dragon as a prerequisite for creating the world? Why does he have multiple heads, breathe fire, and why for that matter would God be beating up a poor place he has swore at the end of days in Isaiah 27 1, if he's already killed him in order to create the earth? Such details imply that Psalm 74 and Isaiah are speaking in the realm of literary symbolism, not narrating a National Geographic special. But what about the original Job passage that kicked this video off? The Creation Museum argues that dragon has to be literal because it appears towards the end of a list of other described literal animals like a lion, an ostrich, and a horse. 
The first problem with this argument is that in earlier chapters, Job refers to other mythic Semitic dragon names that can be found in the Ugaritic text as well, Tananim and Yam. Additionally, these are used synonymously with the name Rahab. Notice the interchangeability of these titles in Job. Job 7.12 Am I Yam, C, or Tananim that you would set watch over me? Job 9.13 God won't withdraw his anger. The helpers of Rahab are humble beneath him. Job 26.12-13 By his power he upheaved the sea. By his wisdom he smote Rahab. His hand pierced the fleeing serpent. You'll notice in that last passage that Rahab is called by the same title Isaiah gives Leviathan and the Ugaritic text give Latanu, the fleeing serpent. It's also important that Job mentions Yam because in the Ugaritic text, the twisting serpent Latanu is also used interchangeably with both Yam and Tananim. Surely I destroyed Yam, beloved of El. Surely I made an end of river, the mighty god. Surely I lifted up the dragon of the two flames. I destroyed the twisting serpent, the tyrant with the seven heads. Earlier in the same text, this tyrant is referred to as Litanu. So there's a respect in which Yam, Litanu, Rahab, Tananim, and Leviathan are all overlapping names. Finally, it should be clear by now that the biblical and Ugaritic texts all associate this monster with the sea. The title Yam literally means sea in Hebrew and Ugaritic. In Job, Leviathan appears as a sea monster, whom God holds dominion over in chapter 41, and defeats in texts like 26, 12 through 13. These passages reflect the fact that in ancient Near Eastern cosmology, Leviathan was seen as the personification of the formless waters of chaos that ever surround and oppose the ordered world. As these texts imply, it is only by God's dominance over these waters that creation is made possible and is sustained. So what you're looking at now is a diagram taken from my book. The watery chaos dragon is well known in art and texts from Israel's ancient neighbors. For the Egyptians, it was personified as the god Apophis, whom Re and his entourage had to defeat daily. For the Babylonians, it was the goddess Tiamat, whom Marduk must slay to create the world. Similar to Psalm 74, which the Jews wrote while in Babylon. Leviathan serves the same literary function in biblical literature as the Chaos Dragon does in the broader ancient Near East. As the personification of the primordial chaotic waters, his defeat by the god demonstrated kingship over the created order. If you've enjoyed this video, it's drawn from my new forthcoming book. Subscribe and stick around, and there will be more like it soon.